All right, so hello everybody. Uh, this is a recording for the Integral Stage uh, YouTube channel. Uh, thank you, Layman and Bruce, for inviting me to uh, do a brief presentation on my take on Utopia with an E at the beginning. Um, my name is Jeremy Johnson. For those of you who are not familiar with my work, I write quite a bit about Integral Philosophy, uh, particularly drawing from the, the, the thinking and the writing of Gene Gepser, a number of other thinkers. My emphasis is on cultural phenomenology, so this is sort of the approach in which, um, the, the way in which I'm answering this question, well, what does utopia mean? What is a vision of a, as the definition goes of this word, a slightly better world, you know, not a world that is perfect with a U, a utopian vision, right? And that, and that kind of question, you know, what's your utopia, would Im implicate a kind of, well, if you could do anything, if you were basically God or a uh, the, the character Q in Star Trek and you could snap your fingers and make the world the way you wanted it to be, how would it be? A utopian vision rather is working in the realm of the possible. A utopian vision with an E is perhaps borrowing from Franco Bifo Berardi's concept of futurability, right? Not only what has the potential in the present to unfold, but also the possibility, like how can it realistically seize the present, right? Um, what are the power dynamics, the tensions, the creative energy that is actually able to manifest? How do we work with that? Because we want to do good in the world, but a utopian vision, a totalizing vision, very often is not so good about the messy in between, between here and there. And I think this is a good moment before we move into a vision of utopia from my own kind of integral, a perspectival take, it would be good to kind of circle around the meaning of the letter U Utopia from Thomas More's novel going on and how we can kind of push off against that quite a bit, uh, significantly even, to understand what utopia with an E isn't, right? So perhaps the, the, the best place to start um, is, is the word itself. Uh, obviously it means no place or non-place. And the story with Thomas More's novel uh, is is intrinsically, you know, inherently there's some problematic dimensions going on because even within the story itself, it, it the, the narrative features um, a moving over to an island in which there are local inhabitants and indigenous population um, and basically subjugating them uh, and indoctrinating them into this perfect society. So even at the very start of that concept, there's this problematic, um, uh, as Gepser might say, perspectival expansion, uh, a colonial colonial mentality in this sort of subjugating of the world to rewrite it or recode it, uh, regardless of the kind of violence that takes place in the process of doing that. So we don't want to really be talking about that. And, we, and, and I think most people, anyway, aren't as interested in talking about that, but we're still, I think this is the tension of today, the kind of structure of feeling that we inhabit in the present. Uh, there is so much fatalism. There is so much anxiety and cynicism about the world. It's very easy to go to oscillate into the dystopian and even resonate strongly with the dystopian. But the opposite oscillation, moving back to the utopian, doesn't quite feel uh, like the next move. It doesn't really feel like uh, we can do so much creatively with that. So that's why I like this distinction of a utopia with an E in that it does have a kind of groundedness, a sort of pragmatic vision, which integrates both the imagination of the possible and the concrete down-to-earth, inhabited, living dynamics of the present that we have to engage with in order to realize the possible, to realize certain creative 
visionary, um, uh, even imaginal potentialities that are perceived where else but the present. So there's a kind of becoming present that I really like in the term, in the phrase, utopia with an E. Um, another push off distinction that we could um, possibly uh, take here is from Gebser himself when he's talking not about utopia, non place, but the kind of thinking that utopia uses, which is in Gebser's phraseology, he calls it perspectival thinking. And what does this actually mean? Well, it, it has to do with, uh, for, for Gebster, the evolution of consciousness is a processual, descriptive restructuring, right? It's, it's describing a restructuring of our senses. McLuhan might call it our sense ratios. Gebster would say, you know, it, it has to do with our phenomenology of being in time and space. So how do we relate to the world? How do we relate to time? How do we, re what is our sense of self, right? So these are ontological in terms of world and being and phenomenological sense-making questions. These have transformed. And so in the perspectival world, uh, the world which he sees as sort of coalescing and intensifying during the Renaissance period and the advent of um, shortly thereafter modernity and humanism uh, is this capacity to make the cut, to emphasize the visual perception as the metaphor for thinking, right? So thinking and being become equated, thinking becomes being ontologically. and in terms of being modern, what becomes important is I, if I, I'll see it, I'll believe it when I see it, right? Um, it's, it, it's essentially a um, realization of three-dimensional space and the capacity of bringing forward that realization with our visual senses. So thinking of landscape painting, et cetera. That's all a precursor and a summary, a very, a very um, simplified summary of the capacity to make the cut, as I mentioned, to have a sectorized vision of the whole, right? And to mistake, you know, the, the, the strength is you can get a lot of details and measurement. You can stand um, in, a, in, a, in a landscape, in a vista, and paint an image of that sunset or that mountain miles in the distance um, from your point of view, right? From the eye looking out to the vanishing point, but in the process of doing so and in thinking and being in the world in this way, right, inhabiting our sense making that way, we cut ourselves off from a more participatory way of involving ourselves in the whole, which for Gebser requires a different kind of sense ratio, a different sort of being in the world that the pre-modern um, uh, human being had a different relationship with. They could participate experientially. They could involve themselves imaginally in an enchanted cosmos in some way. Um, now everybody, you know, this is not to say, to delineate, these are no, no hard cuts, right? That would be very perspectival. Um, but this is really, in the Renaissance, this is really where that kind of mode of being in the world it, it becomes grounded and increasingly the focus of our, of our sense-making as a civilization. So this is all to say that a sectorized vision might be able to bring in particulars, allow us to map and measure and spatialize and therefore individuate the self is the waking, measuring, egoic self, right, that is able to go forth in space and master space. Um, think, too, of the ambiguity there. Go forth and, 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 and shape space as we will. There's, there's a kind of implied abstraction in this to kind of stand above, to look down, and to map, to visualize, to categorize, and to restructure as we will. Um, think of utopia. Think of Moore's story. Um, the ambiguity here in mistaking the part for the whole, right? We're able to make parts, we're able to make the cut, we're able to sectorize and divide and perform, as, as Gebser says, ratio. 
But in doing so, the sector becomes mistaken for the whole. And look at the word specifically, the kind of cousin of utopia, with a U, is totality or totalizing. Where we always say we need to avoid totalizing thought. What does that actually mean? Well, if you look at the etymology of totality, T-O-T, tot means in an ambiguous sense, all or nothing or all or dead. Death, something's dead. There's, there's quite an ambiguity there, right? And it's like I either got this or I'm screwed. You know, there's a sense of um, um, deep angst in in and really looking at the meaning of that word. And I think this is good because we can have a kind of abstract totalizing vision, but the vision is intrinsically uh, without life, without not just the spark, but the capacity to, to stand on its own without uh, the thinker giving it life and abstraction, right? through the process of thinking and visualizing and abstraction. So totali totalizing thought is inherently um, uh, a, a, th a thinking towards death, a thinking towards non-being, a thinking towards non-existence. And this is why it's sort of the cousin of the word utopia, a non-place. Well, uh, a totality is really not a, it's not a true whole. It's, it's a sort of a, uh, uh, an ersatz wholeness uh, ersatz meaning a fake wholeness, right? It's really kind of a lifeless um, simulacrum of the reality. So this isn't to say that perspectival thinking is bad. It's that when it becomes totalizing, we are no longer able to engage with the living, with the real, in a way that is much more dynamic and has much more manifold ways of engagement now, thinking itself is obviously not just this. Again, it is um, this totalizing orientation. So this is all a pre preamble to being able to speak of utopia with an E. So if we can define the perspectival age, uh, the age of uh, the mental rational, Gebser, Gebser calls it the mental structure of consciousness, which has been sort of coalescing, intensifying, and then ossifying um, in the last few hundred years. Uh, Wilbur, Ken Wilbur kind of understands this, I believe, as the, as the rational um, in spiral dynamics. It's more of the, the, the modern or orange in the color-coded uh, schematics of spiral dynamics. Obviously, it's a little bit more than that. There's differences in these maps. But if we move into, into a question of where we are right now, it's been called the meta crisis. It's been called planetary crisis, uh, planetary evolutionary leap, um, the move into second tier, um, uh, jump time. <laughs> um, all of these ways of phrasing where we're at is that there's this momentous leap that we need to take. And what does it mean to take that leap? Does it mean a move into a utopian vision? Or can we have a different sense of the future? And I would argue at the most radical ontological level of extent, the future no longer belongs to a mode of thinking that has been characteristic since the Renaissance of this marching forward to build utopia, this progressive march in directed linear time, increasingly becoming more active, increasingly becoming more busy, and increasingly becoming faster and faster and faster and more abstract and more abstract. If there is a utopia with an E, it is a world in which reversals have come into play. Marshall McLuhan talks quite a bit about the importance and significance of reversals. And I think this is, I think he's an integral thinker in this sense, a utopian thinker in this sense. Um, Ursula K. Le Guin writes actually appropriately in, in a Verso Books edition of uh, Thomas More's Utopia. She has some essays. One is called Yintopia, Yangtopia. And rather than a utopia, she sees the future as belonging to a, a movement backward, a movement into reversal. 
Now, reversal doesn't always mean regression, and I think we need to make that distinction at the outset before we hear the rest of this. Reversal does not mean regression. Reversal very often means regeneration, reintegration, and the much more nuanced, nonlinear, and complex process of cultural evolution unfolds in that way. There are steps forward, there are steps backward, there are steps sideways. Um, our whole attitude and mentality, again, born out of that three-dimensional sense of linear time, progress, etc., it doesn't have room in this future. So automatically, I think we can rule out utopia with a U. We can rule out, this is the covet, this is the cherished word in integral community circles, progress. We can rule that out in, in the sense of the mentality it comes with. Um, we will still be able to talk about a better world, I think, without needing the baggage of a progress-oriented world, as articulated by Steven Pinker. Steven Pinker would be a utopian in this sense, in that he's marching towards incremental progress. It's going in a certain direction. Rather, a yintopia is a topia, a, a world, right? A topology of undulations and reversals, reintegrations. And I would love to read to you now uh, a line or two from Ursula K. Le Guin to sort of set the tone here. And this is from my essay, which I can share um, for, for Bruce and, and Lehman to put in the notes here. Um, my side view essay called Meta Modern Understanding the Phenomenology of Consciousness. And I quote, Ursula K. Le Guin's excellent essay, which is also in the more Verso Books edition, a non-Euclidean view of California as a cold place to be. And in this essay, Le Guin writes, side trips and reversals are precisely what minds stuck in forward gear most need. Knowledge is power, and we want to know what comes next. We want it all mapped out. And later she writes, I don't think we're ever going to get to utopia again by going forward, but only roundabout or sideways. And I continue with uh, my own phrasing here and borrowing from Tim Morton's philosophy. The, this uncanny world of hyper objects we have entered defies categorical and compulsory mapping. There really are no maps for these territories. And I think this phraseology here also echoes and reflects the mentality we're seeing in a lot of modern literature. Uh, I specifically think of, for example, if you want a utopian vision with an E, a vision of a reversal in literature, I would read the first book uh, of the Southern Reach trilogy by Jeff Vandermeer called uh, Annihilation. Um, it's, it's a great trilogy, but uh, the first book is almost a standalone book, and it's a short one too. And in this text, um, I, I won't go into all the details at the moment, I will circle back to it, but for the purposes of that Le Guin quote, reversals are what's going on. In this book, there is a special zone where reality is breaking down, where a particular kind of invasion, is it alien is it something else? It's hard to know. Uh, but whatever it is, it's infectious. It, it gets into us almost ontologically. It's, um, it's been called weird ecology or uh, eco-horror. So the utopian vision has room for the sublime as terror and not just the sublime as beautiful heights of Apollonic perfection. So that's perhaps one of the uh, additional criteria here for what it EU topia actually could be, but reversal in the sense that the book almost is a sort of reversal of this process of modernization and globalization. Nature becomes something wholly other, and yet at the most sublime level, at the most inarticulate domain of our being, it's already in us, it's already us. We are so sublimely other, right? We've met the alien, so to speak, and the alien is us, and we don't know how to fathom that. And it's already 
in the innermost reaches of our being and of our world and it's growing right the zone in the book is is expanding um and there's nothing they can really do it's a kind of reverse uh, reverse colonization process going on in the book so i say that as a sort of fun science fiction way of describing reversals the resurgence of certain things that we thought we had paved over with utopia that being specifically um, climate and nature. Uh, so in this vision of a utopia with an E, the resurgence of the non-human world becomes more pressing, a predominant concern, a major theme of, uh, a, 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 at the moment it's an anxiety, and I think in the book as an example, uh, the Vandermeer book, it's it's treated as horror and 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 beauty at the same time but there's an anxiety in it so i will get to how we can flip that anxiety more into a creative participation with this more than human world but nevertheless the reversal is the opening of the human back into the non-human the ceasing of the engines of progress right to slow down or even to go back and find another way towards what Teilhard de Chardin described as planetization. It's not going to be going forward. However we reach the planetary, right? However we reach the world-centric or the integral, it is not a neat sequential process from ethnocentric to world-centric to cosmocentric. And maybe from that abstract utopian vision, we could easily abstractly, aloofly describe it that way. But to aloofly describe it that way is to, is to already render the map dead, right? We, it, there's already no, no life in it. We have to come back down into the imminent and find a way to actually describe what these processes are rather than simply categorize them happening. Um, our maps have to become, and I write about this in Metamodern, that the essay, our maps must somehow become more like the living territories and topologies that they describe. Then we begin to enter into a relationship with the real, uh, with the living world, and not just the abstract dead world. Again, these are sort of simplifications, but I think they, they help generate the image here. So, reversals. Um, an acknowledgement of, of what needs to be remediated. So what would this mean in terms of the post-human? First of all, nature, ecology, and the human being in the rest of the biosphere. That's a very scientific approach. It's a very material, biological, but material approach. So, so let's move more into an anthropological question and say the post-human in the anthropological theme is actually... Uh, more distinctly, a post-humanism, right? Again, humanism born of the perspectival renaissance, coalesced during the, the rise and intensification of modernity in the process of globalizing, in the process of colonization, etc. That mentality no longer becomes the center. And here is where a real possibility lies, I think, for us in if we can dislodge this perspectival mentality, which in its expressions has, has rendered or manifested in the world the aforementioned processes of colonization, industrialization, uh, the destruction of, of human and non-human life worlds, right? Wonderful technologies as well, to be sure, but deep, deep ambiguities, irreconcilable ambiguities, tensions that would tear it eventually apart, which is what we're seeing happen now. And I think here's the thing that, that, that in order to step into utopia, we have to learn to accept. These tensions, which now threaten to tear our society apart, um, these deep ambiguities in the process of modernity are not, are not synthesizable they are going through a death process and will die. The world of modernity, the world of progressive linear time has already outlived itself. 
when Francis Fukuyama was describing the end of history. He didn't know how right he was in, in, a, in a much more ontological sense. Uh, time is not, time doesn't belong to modernity. Clock time, progressive time. Time is much more, and that's going to be another element we'll explore. But the ending of history, the consummation of time as this linear progressive directionality, this is the time that is dying. This is the time that has already flown apart, that will not be reconciled. But it needs to happen because, if we look at the anthropological question that I mentioned, this one directional forward gear movement has, like the sectoring of the perspectival human being, severed us from the, 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 the genuine integrity of the human, right? The magical and the mythical, uh, the archaic even. These, for the, for the Westerner, perhaps, for the secular Westerner, these are earlier structures. Of course, they're all the structures are co-present and there are societies that have those structures still very much efficiently expressed and more present. Um, but in the, in, in the context of secularized global culture, originating in modernity, we have severed ourselves from the magic and the mythic. We have severed ourselves from the mythical participation in the whole through image, through soul making. We have severed ourselves from the magical intermingling uh, of all in all. Uh, that indigenous societies s continue to teach us, you know, in terms of what we are gravely, gravely, profoundly missing. So this forward march has cut us off from our own past and ironically culminated in the end of its own progressive march. So the perspective of a world has no future and it has no past. It truly has arrived at utopia, a nothing, a no place, a void. And this obviously is a deeply spiritual crisis that Verveke describes as the meaning crisis that Gebser talks about as the, 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 the collapse of the perspectival world um, uh, and, and relates um, a lot of 20th century philosophy, especially existentialism, as very descriptive of, of being thrown into being. But not having that depth and the integrity and the wholeness of the human to engage in the crisis of the present only exacerbates the present, only makes us more impotent to face the challenges of tomorrow. So none of these things have to do with a perfect future society. Rather, a utopian attitude is a becoming radically present again, becoming radically open to what needs to be remediated and regenerated and ultimately healed. So it is a world of yintopias, of reversals, of slowing down, of um, decentering of the humanist tradition, of modernity, of the workings and mechanisms of modernity, like colonialism and capitalism. You know, these things need to shrink or disappear or go away. And I won't say that the utopian mistake would be to say, all right, it's a world without all those things those things are probably going to be around and the harder work will be this question of how we build a, a, a planet that is able to contain them, shrink them, miniaturize them, render them um, a smaller organism in a much larger ecology of the human and the non-human world. So reversals, yintopia, slowing down, a shift. And this is what I've been writing in my next um my next book called uh, Fragments of an Integral Future or Fragments of an Integral Futurism. I haven't finalized the title yet. There's little nuances as to why I haven't finalized it. Um, but to summarize, um, Tehard described the process of planetization as the world kind of converging in the thinking layer of the earth and that thinking layer would be founded in a sort of spiritual love, human being center to center, uh, a, conver a convergence of individuals and cultures coming together in a planetary consciousness. I, I want to make another discernment in terms of, 
uh, regeneration versus regression. Here's a second one, globalization versus planetization. Now, the process of globalizing that, that, that seems to have been initiated primarily by uh, Western Europe in terms of its expansionism and, and colonization and advent of um, uh, early capitalism and now global capitalism, this, this civilization that has really come online over the past five, six hundred years, this is coming to a head, it's coming to, to an end in some sense, we're becoming something else. So I think it's important for us to distinguish, have discernment between that process, the process of modernity and globalization, specifically globalization, and what Tehard is talking about, planetization. Globalization may have been a wave, a pulse, um, uh, to borrow a Tehardian phrase that he used all the time talking about in evolutionary theory, a, a radiation, right? When a phylum radiates. Okay, so here we are. We're experimenting. We're, we're, we're actively reaching, without knowing how to get there, a, uh, the process of planetization. It, does, it doesn't work, right? There's a collapse, there's a folding back, there's a reversal. And there may be another way we, we become planetary, but it will be in a completely different direction, right? It will be, uh, as Jeff Goldblum says, life finds a way. There is, there is a rhizomatic kind of line of flight to alterity in which planetization can take place, but it is not the process of globalization as we have defined it and as it's understood. So whatever utopia is, it is a process of planetization. Planetization, um, I think, has many of the same features that we've already been describing for utopia, for an integral world, and that would be um, reversals, a return to the hyperlocal, a remediation um, uh, process of decolonization, and a strong word would be anti-capitalism. Uh, a word that I think more integralists are, are friendlier with is post-capitalist. I would argue that um, I am more of an anti-capitalist, but historically speaking, whatever is happening is after capitalism, so I'm fine agreeing with post-capitalist. So I will just simply say it is post-capitalist. It is post-colonial and decolonial. It is a slowing down. It is an ontology that is in a more active and permeable relationship with the non-human world. It is, to borrow from the peer-to-peer -peer movement, from uh, uh, Jose Ramos, Ramos and uh, Michelle Bowen's, uh, uh, a cosmo-local orientation, meaning that it is a move from a totalizing, as we've been talking about, right, the building up of macro nation states, the building up of economic empires, the building up of free markets and, and, uh, and the process of globalization. Uh, that hegemonic domain is becoming, it's decomposing, it's collapsing. And in this process, there's new centers, there's decentering taking place. That actually doesn't need to be, again, discernment of regression versus um, reversal. This could be potentially a reversal. The cosmolocal is the capacity to bring back healthy, bottom up, decentralized, hyper localized um, communities in which capitalist anomie and the loss of the local, et cetera, the loss of the commons have been rehabilitated in a new way, but in a way in which they remain actively connected to the whole, perhaps to share in peer-to-peer -peer networks, perhaps to um, pass along vital information for subsistence and survivability, perhaps to, in the flux of this future society, move between different scales of organization to achieve certain projects. Let's say we want to do, uh, I don't know, in 200, 300 years, this utopian culture that is more planetary wants to do a moonshot or wants to start a Mars colony. 
Um, you might say that's more of the contemporary modernistic approach, but maybe not. Maybe we, we were scared of asteroids and, and uh, there's a genuine interesting project uh, that we want to set up on Mars uh, to, to help the perpetu perpetuity of life as we rehabilitate the Earth. Let's just throw that scenario out there. Maybe that would be the case where the more yang, the more directive, the more large-scale organizational process can take place. And like a phallic movement, rise and fall and go away. But intrinsic to this utopian vision is that we're not stuck in that forward march, that totalizing vision. So this is all to kind of, let's fold back a little bit and go back to the Cosmo Local. I don't see, and this is just my opinion, of course, but I, and I think we've already begun to see this as, as especially in the United States, as questions of, of federal competency are being raised and regional answers are being addressed and attempted to be organized. A society of the future by necessity, perhaps, in a post-capitalist future in which climate is going to become increasingly a, a, an existential concern for more of us, and an economics which can reflect a world that is finite, which can reflect the resilience of a bioregion to sustain a population, that kind of economics and that kind of society is going to have to be a lot more localized, a lot more local looking. And this has been called bioregionalism. I think there could be different scales of economics, different types of currencies that are working at different levels in a dynamic fluency in response to the capabilities of uh, our bioregions, resources, etc. So I think we need a much more dynamic relationship to the planet and to our bioregionalism. And there's plenty of great work from uh, Daniel Christian Wall to Joe Brewer um, and many others in the regenerative movement that are talking about this. And these folks, if you really look at what they're talking about today, they're not being utopians with a U. These are all deeply really fundamental down-to-earth questions, quite literally in the soil in terms of um, how can we scale up from the bottom? How can we build a society that can function with the earth and the biosphere at a bioregional level? And then what might we need to do to restructure the entire way we globalize, which I'm saying needs to be to, to planetize, to decenter, to move away from totalizing visions of homogenous nation states in a unidirectional um, growth oriented um, uh, uh, directionality. These things, while they sound a little utopian in terms of this is what needs to happen, are deeply practical questions. And as I've been saying, profoundly existential ones, not only for our generation, but our children and our children's children. This is, these are the questions that we're already gripping with, we're already wrestling with. So a utopia is, is you know, this is the radical sense of it, that it, it retains its radicalism, it retains its far out visionary possibility because of how imminent and present and transparent it is to the problems of the present, of this crisis that we're in right now. When we become transparent to those issues, the flip side is to see the answers to those issues as well. Okay, sounds like we're going to have to become more bioregional. Sounds like this totalizing process of um, becoming more and more meta, more and more unidirectional, faster and faster in our economic systems, etc. It's not a good idea. It, it, it is an existential threat to our own perpetuity on this planet and perhaps for much of the life on the planet as well. So I think we've seen this and I, I can share this article as well from Kim Stanley Robinson where he talked about how uh, this year the pandemic has transformed our imaginations, has transformed the imagination of the possible. A lot of the ideals and visions of quote unquote green folks, um, progressives, etc 
are no longer periphery. They're no longer perceived necessarily as vision, uh, visionary or, or unrealistic. They, they may be unrealistic in terms of the political process, but when it comes to the existential stakes, they are at the center and everyone's worried about them. They're worried about supply chains. They're worried about the next pandemic. They're worried about global complexity. It's generally speaking, manifesting as a negative structure of feeling about the whole. But the flip side to that is that we are becoming aware of the whole in the, in, in the, in the most, the, the, the most down to earth way in terms of like, where's our food going to come from? You know, if, if, if a supply chain goes down. So the move towards the, the, the local, the retrieval of the commons, the coming back to um, the human oriented and the human centered, but also on the flip side of that, the interfacing, right? The permeability with the non-human world in ecology. And I would also say in spirituality, because it's really only in moderns, it's really only in the perspectival mental rational world where our access to the non-human, the world of the, 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 the spirits, the world of the dead, um, the, the, a living animistic reality, cosmology, um, that world continues to exist. And if we see it as some earlier stage in which we've projected our, our niceties and our imaginations and our wish fulfillments around death, if that is all it is, then we are, sorry to say, completely trapped in, the, in, the, in, in that totality of the utopia, the non-place, and this is, that is the same attitude. So, regenerative, it's cosmolocal, it's a yintopia, yintopia. It's, it's a reversal, right? Um, it's a move, it's an acceptance that we're moving from globalization into planetization, that the process of globalization is discontinuous with planetization, right? It's a, globalization's a dead end. We have to go back in order to really think about how to move if it's not forward, then perhaps sideways, perhaps spherically speaking, you know, the, the, a direction of back and forward makes little sense on a spherical planet. How do we engage imminently with the whole? I think this is the question that will become profoundly resonant with our, with our descendants. So what else can we say about a utopia? Well, we've gone over a couple of terms. We've gone over a couple of themes. Um, I would generally circle back to Gepser and say all of these themes have to do with what Gepser described as the integral, a perspectival world. Now he distinguishes this from perspectivity that we talked about at the beginning. The a perspectival whole, as he says, a is in the prefix alpha privativum, meaning uh, um, freedom from and freedom for. There's a liberational quality to this. Um, it is not a denial of the perspectival. It is not a denial of, of, of the gains of modernity, so to speak, but rather a decentering of them in favor of a greater whole. So there's that. This is the a perspectival world we're really describing here and the process of coming to terms with its reality. And I think this is something that a practical EU utopia is very considerate of. Uh, not just how do we get to where we need to get because the existential risks are so high, but also what is arriving either with us or in spite of us, right? What is the world that is rendering itself, that is um, concretizing whether or not we work with it? And I think, you know, climate crisis and the so-called Anthropocene, or Donna Haraway calls it the Cthulhu scene. This world is that world, right? It has an ontology. It has a way of sense making that we can learn. And so long as we aren't receptive to it, very practically speaking, in a deeply personal way and also in a cultural way in, in terms of our collective ac activity, it's going to show up negatively as catastrophe for us. But catastrophe can become a learning crisis, as Michelle Bowens describes, a pedagogical catastrophe. 
So we can learn from this and the beginnings of a utopia and the beginnings of planetization or the beginning of the aperspective of a world is a process of making profound mistakes in order to learn what the integral world is attempting to remediate, to wear, W-A-R-E, right, to become aware of in, in the integral sense, uh, to presentiate. It's, it's like, um, it's like a, a personal crisis of your unconscious when you, you really need to come to a realization about yourself and it keeps hitting you in the face until you do, right? I guess you could not make that realization if you want, but you're going to have a hard time. And perhaps the stumbling and the shadow work and the process of rendering this conscious and learning from it is the process of learning to become planetary. And that's all utopia really is, 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 is our learning to become planetary, being ready to make mistakes. Now, let us hope, though, right, that the mistakes aren't so, so dire that we cannot recover from them. I think that would be the tragedy. So when Gepster says in Ever Present Origin that, you know, the integral world won't be a utopia, I don't think he uses that word, but he, uh, it amounts to him describing, you know, it won't be this perfect place, but it will be a little better. But the subtle, remember the yin-topia, right? The hidden, the dark, the invisible, the reversal, and yin and yang. The yin is so important. It's subtle, as Shinzen Young says, but significant. So a little better could mean quite a lot. A little better is finding those acupuncture points, those meridians, those, those fine-tuned, um, um, uh, skillful uses of energy, creativity, and action to turn everything over. And so this is also, I think, part of what utopia means. I wanted to read a few little bits and pieces here and there, and then we'll close. But I found this from Marshall McLuhan to be a, a kind of endearing way to, to begin this section where we start to talk about time um, and place. So we, we hinted at this with the, with the integral world. And I think we need to get into the ontological because the ontological is not as abstract as we think it is. So he's saying, when Sputnik had first gone into orbit, a school teacher asked her second graders to write some verse on the subject. One child wrote, the stars are so big, the earth is so small, stay as you are. And McLuhan continues, with man his knowledge and the process of obtaining knowledge are of equal magnitude. Our ability to apprehend galaxies and subatomic structures as well as a movement of faculties that includes and transcends them. The second grader who wrote the words above lives in a world much faster than any which a scientist today has instruments to measure or concepts to describe. As W.B. Yeats wrote of this reversal, the visible world is no longer a reality and the unseen world is no longer a dream. And he's talking about reversals. Um, and in, in this, he is implying that the movement to the space age during his time is in the 60s, right? The stars are so big, the earth is so small, stay as you are, speaking of Sputnik. The movement to the space age renders space, you know, even then, the poetics he understood, that there was a great reversal happening, superseding directional spatial consciousness and moving into a kind of um, aspatial all at onceness. So it's a vast universe and stay as you are, right? Doesn't mean it become frozen. It means, I think anyway, my take on this is a sort of imminence. It's a sort of imminent place of um, communion with the world and a supersession of the distances as vast as they are in communion with them. Um, earlier, he even talks about this and I have to bring this in, of course. Um, speaking of reversals, he says, so the greatest of all reversals occurred with electricity that ended sequence by making things instant. With instant speed, the causes of things began to emerge to awareness again, as they had not done with things in sequence and in the concatenation accordingly. Instead of asking which came first, the chicken or the egg, 
it suddenly seemed that a chicken was an egg's idea for getting more eggs. And he continues, just speaking about reversals, that great pattern of being that reveals new and opposite forms just as the earlier forms reach their peak performance. Mechanization was never so vividly fragmented or sequential as in the birth of movies. Well, he should see the internet. The moment that translated us beyond mechanism into the world of growth and organic interrelation. The movie, by sheer speeding up of the mechanical, carried us from the world of sequence and connections into the world of creative configuration and structure. The message of the movie medium is that of transition from lineal connections to configurations. And later he says, we return to the inclusive form of the icon. And I use this as an example is what I mean of what I mean about the intensification of modernity, the process of globalization. When it ramps up enough, what we need to begin to talk about from utopia is then moving into a yintopia, and that is the reversal process. This is sort of a great pattern of being that he's talking about. I think we're undergoing right now. I think the internet's a great example of this, this reversal of being that we're talking about. Progress in this world is not necessary. The ontology that this world is, is alluding, that is um, inhabiting us and we inhabiting it, requires new, th new modes of thinking about time and space, in which the artist, I would add, is very often the best, the best resource, the best the best way in which we can ascertain and even cultivate a new subjectivity in relation to that new ontology, right? So the artist teaches us our mode of being in the world, and also the artist is sensitive to the changes of that mode of being in the world. So in the process towards utopia, I would suggest we become very sensitive to art and what art is doing. So that's McLuhan for you, and I can do a whole thing on McLuhan, and we simply can't because there's just not enough time. Another thing I wanted to share, of course, is not only this being where we are, uh, moving away from lineal sequence and directionality to, to simultaneity, um, but also the theme itself of temporix. So I want to say this. There's a few, there's a few notes about... Um, what we mean by by time in the integral a perspective of world and i'm going to read this to you in just a moment okay so this is from a essay by beo akumalafe and beo is a great post-humanist writer he's a utopian thinker he's an he's an he's a uh a perspectival philosopher uh i highly recommend his work and he's talking about Benjamin's um, definition of redemption. We're speaking, of course, we, we have been speaking, of course, of regeneration, remediation, um, uh, reversal. I would add redemption here to begin to talk about time. And he says, it is important to stress that Benjamin isn't speaking of the Messiah of theological conception, not a human figure that steps in at the end of history but messianic time, splinters and traces of the eternal that interrupt the passage of time and its conformism to the dictates of progress. This stepping in, like advents, happens within history. The trace flashes up in history, but it is not of history. It is outside the text. Seeing the text in the very post-humanist way the aliens in the movie Arrival saw time, as a constellational image. What did we just read from McLuhan? Configuration, right? Constellation, configuration. As a constellational image, as rhythms of transience, not the transcendent and monotonous fetishization of the next. I love that paragraph, and I'll, again, I will share this with you. Um, and with that one, this opens up what we mean by time, and specifically what Gepser meant when he talks about the aperspectival world as time freedom. It is imminent to history, but not of it. Uh, we have an ego, but we are, not, we are not the ego, as it were. So ego freedom, 
time freedom and space freedom are the three important themes that Gebser brings in his in his integral phenomenology um, in, in terms of understanding uh, the qualities of this emergent structure of consciousness. This is a new relationship to time. But remember that since it is not of time, but sort of imminent to it, right, in, in the intersections and in the, in the, in the traces within history, there's these lines of flight into the timeless, into the eternal. For Gebser, this is also a reclaiming of time's true intensity. For Gebser, time is as important for the future human being, the integral world, as space was for the Renaissance, as space was for the modern, the perspectival world. Time and its intensity and its openness and its manifold potentiality is the creative matrix in which the human being can continue their process of, of, of evolution and, and realization, right? If, if, if know thyself and then, of course, go forth into space and shape it according to thy will, you know, this sort of modernist mentality, if that was important then, then for the integral, it is, it is uh, open thyself to the plenum of creative origin in the present, the, the imminence of time freedom. This will either be our undoing our, or the opening up for our own participation with creation, right? A cosmology that is creative, that is imminent, and that is present. And I want to really emphasize this, right? For each of the different structures for Gebser and, and his phenomenology, each structure of consciousness has a kind of way of looking at and, and experiencing time. But the perspective we've already been talking about, clock time, sequence, directionality, progress, etc. In the mythical, it's rhythmic time, rhythmicity. Um, in the magical, briefly, it's that sort of imminent timelessness of trance, of um, days, uh, hours that stretch and feel like days or feel like an eternity. Or days that fly by and seem like it was no time at all um, has really passed. These different modes of time which constitute our being at all as humans um, become accessible to us, become resuscitated, become remediated, right, in terms of reversals. But they do so be due to this new center which is not really a center, but an opening, a plenum of time freedom, of the creative origin, of the intensity of time that we have to learn to work with in order to survive existentially in a material sense. Uh, this is a very pragmatic utopia, but a deeply spiritual present and post-human one. And to get to a few more interesting little uh, uh, bits of quotes for us. I wanted to share a little bit of a very Gibsarian thinker. This is from a great book called The Scent of Time that I've been reading uh, by Byung Chul Han. He's a, a, a German Korean philosopher. And uh, what he ends up writing here, he says, uh, well, first of all, he has a very similar prognosis to Gebser in terms of the future that we need to be moving away from what he calls via activa, busy time, filling time, making time, measuring it, categorical time, speeding forward into, into, into the future, into progress. Uh, and, and, and in a certain sense, have that reversal capacity of becoming present and slowing down, which he calls via contemplativa. Um, and he says this, even when it comes to thinking, this contemplativa, this becoming present, this non-linearity is intrinsic to thinking, right? So he says, okay, so he says, the understanding is only concerned with needs and necessity, but not with luxury, which represents a deviation from necessity, even from all things straight and direct. A special temporality and spatiality is intrinsic to thinking, that rises above calculating. So he's distinguishing thinking from calculating. 
it does not progress in linear fashion, right? This is real thinking. What is it? It does not progress in linear th fashion. Thinking is free because it, its place and time cannot be calculated. It often progresses discontinuously while calculation follows a linear path. This calculation can be precisely located and in principle accelerated at will. Calculating does not look around either. For it, a detour or a step back does not make sense. They only delay the step in the calculation, which is purely a step of the work process. Today, thinking assimilates itself to labor. However, the animal laborans is incapable of thinking. So what is he saying here? He's saying this progressive obsessed, directive obsessed, possessed even mode of being in the world is less than thought. It doesn't even have the capacity to truly be inhabiting thinking because thinking requires meandering, detours, side reel moves, right? It can only mechanically progress forward, can only calculate, and therefore it, it is not a, even a, um, a conscious capability. It's a, it's a roteness. It's a sort of trance. And he continues, without rest, human beings are incapable of seeing what is at rest. Making the vita activa an absolute value drives everything out of life that is not an act or activity. The general time pressures destroy all that has the character of a detour, all that is indirect, and thus makes the world poor in forms. Every form, every figure is a detour. Only naked formlessness is direct. If language is deprived of what is indirect in it, its nature approaches that of a scream or an order, right? Do it mindlessly, thoughtlessly, just act. Friendliness and politeness are also based on the circuitous and indirect. The orientation of violence, by contrast, is towards directness. And there's even a deeper etymology here between rect and right. And um, interestingly, uh, Gebser makes an interesting combination here when he's talking about the, uh, the evolution of the mental structure of consciousness and the going forth into the world, um, meant and meant, uh, the etymology of mental is in wrath. So the sort of directed wrath on the battlefield of opposition is, is part of this sort of mode of, of uh, uh, um, perspectival consciousness and the mental structure of consciousness that, is, that he's actually talking about here. Like I said, um, yeah, um, Han is, is very, very Gibsarian in, in many senses. But he continues, If walking lacks all hesitation, all pausing, then it freezes into a march. Time pressures also make what is ambivalent and undecidable, what hovers, the complex or aporetic, give way to a crude distinctness. Nietzsche remarks that the haste of work also makes the ear and the eye for the melody of the movements disappear. A melody is a detour. Only what is monotonous is direct. Thinking is also marked by a melody. Thinking that entirely lacks any circuitous character degenerates into calculation. But then when we move from via activa to this creative becoming present, right? The capacity to detour, to slow down, to... Um, uh, Bayo Akamalafe also has a great essay about um, the slow urgency, right? How do we respond to the planet? planetary crisis in the Anthropocene. It is through a slow urgency to slow down to be able to make not only choices, not only direct choices, but sometimes the answer is in the detour. The answer is in the seizing up of the machine. The answer is in the non-doing. How hard is it to, to not do? The, the problem we have with today's barreling towards disaster is not so much our our, uh, what we're not doing as what we are doing too much, too actively, too directly, too mindlessly, right? Um, so there, there's a kind of paradox in that. But when we move into the contemplativa, when we become present, time becomes our creative partner. And this is Han again, where he says, contemplative lingering interrupts the time which is labor. Quote, work and activity in time are the same. The Vita Contemplativa elevates time 
itself. As opposed to Arendt, Hannah Arendt's claim, there is no one-sided appreciation of the via contemplativa in the Christian tradition. And then he mentions Meister Eckhart saying like, be active, activa is good, but it needs the contemplativa. So I think this utopian turn is a becoming present, becoming imminent, um, a phrase that I really love that I borrow from Bruno Latour's work, who I think is um, congruent with what we're talking about here, is uh, moving down to earth, towards the terrestrial is the new attractor. Um, feet on the ground, inhabiting the present, no longer speeding forward. There's nowhere to speed forward. And accepting that, right? So I will close perhaps with this idea that time becomes a predominant creative concern for the future rather than a predominant or possessed anxiety that we have today. Time becomes a creative concern, a creative expression that we participate with rather than time being something that possesses us that we cannot overcome, that feels like it's a a vanishing point um, of catastrophe and of anxiety about the future and what we're not doing, right? So whatever this utopia looks like, it is deeply present, it is concretized, it is down to earth, um, and it is inhabiting the present and all of the um, descriptive characteristics and motifs that I've tried to articulate in this presentation. I would close now simply state part of this new ontology, uh, part of this inhabiting of the present is a particular kind of, as the final quality, um, we talked about an openness of this integral ontology. And I think uh, another way of saying this would be that that Cartesian split that was discussed earlier, what would it mean to concretely, existentially, culturally overcome that, right? It doesn't mean, you know, bless their hearts, go to non-dual conferences. Um, it means a way of actually living in which the past and the future are in the present for the human being, creatively, artistically, spiritually. It means the human and the non-human, there's an openness, a porousness between us. It means that like our ancestors were able to do, an openness to the dead, an openness to the ancestors. But if time is opened up, it also means an openness to our descendants in the unborn. So time is a kind of communion with the deep past and the living future in the living present. And this is not a utopia. This is a manifest ontology that the Anthropocene is, is showing us, right? This is the seductive ontology of the future that we can inhabit presently and work to concretize presently. This might manifest at a technological level not in just biomimicry, but literally, you know, I, I use the example of Neri Oxman's work quite a bit from MIT, um, a creative partnership with the non-human world to help grow human environments. You know, uh, one of her examples is the, um, uh, the Silkworm Project, where she collaborated with silkworms to create um, a kind of awning. Uh, and there's many other examples uh, using uh, the cellular structure of certain insect skins to create, uh, to replace plastics. Um, models of post-industrial growth that look more like organismic growing, you know, the uh, growing of an organism rather than a factory line assembly. Um, of course, this also echoes back to what we were saying earlier about regenerative economics. Can our economics look more like and be transparent to living systems? Can our engineering and our architecture be transparent to living systems in the non-human world and even collaborative with them? Uh, the human becoming non-human, becoming human. 
this is the final thing to say that the integral ontology in this utopian vision is one in which Neri Oxman has this phrase that we we have we talk about mother nature well now we need to move into mothering nature as a process as a verb and I would continue to flip that and and simultaneously state that we are we must work with mother nature right like nature is resurgent in the anthropocene and the human being is participatory in that and so we become covalent we become diaphanous meaning transparent meaning open as we're saying in this integral ontology to the non-human the human becoming non-human becoming human participating with uh haraway's sympoietic right that means with creating with there's a withness in the integral ontology and openness this is what we have to learn this is not going to be a utopia there'll be plenty of mistakes life is never utopic life however is sympoietic and if there's anything that we truly need to master in a beautiful way in a more beautiful world as charles eisenstein says it is um, the capacity to fold in that sympoietic open way in which um, <laughs> nature natures itself, in which living things are alive in a process of mutual learning. We have to be open to that process and fold that on ontology and understanding into ourselves and with such an intensity as we've never had before. And so this is how I see an integral ontology as both a seductive one in which this sounds way more appealing to me than dystopia. Uh, utopia sounds boring, but a e-utopia, uh, a, a pragmatic down to earth working with the world and what it speaks and, and how it is speaking to us, um, an openness to the world, an openness to the open world. For me, that is the world I want to live in. And that is the world I choose to, to every day attempt to inhabit because this is not something, the one lesson you take from this video, this future world is not out there. This future world is imminent to us. Um, what would it mean for time to become transparent? And I don't want us to ask that abstractly. I mean, phenomenologically in our own or in our own selves. And I, I leave with that because I can get into other stuff, but I think this is enough for the for this particular um, offering. So I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, you can, of course, follow me on Patreon. Uh, thanks again, Bruce and Lehman. Uh, I'll have links for all the stuff that I mentioned for you guys, and uh, feel free to reach out to me anytime with your own reflections about um, an integral, a perspectival, utopian future. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.